You know, today we are continuing this teaching series that we've been in called God Is. And the thrust of this series, the hope and the prayer of this series is that together we would build a biblical, functioning, working theology, a concept of who God is. We've said since the very beginning that what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. No matter how you define God, if you define God as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that's true for you. If you define God as just why you exist and what you do in this world, that's true for you as well. What you think about when you think about God is the most significant, the most important thing about you. And we started this conversation way back in Genesis chapter one, verse one, where we talked about the fact that God is creator. Today, we are going to come to a point, we are at a point that is a natural consequence of where we've been over the last few weeks. Today, we're taking up the subject, God is judge. God is the judge of all people everywhere for all time. And I know as soon as I say that God is judged, some people are like, oh man, I should have gone to brunch. And I understand where that comes from. I really do. But I promise you, if you will hang in there through this entire discussion today, I really believe that you're going to come to see that the fact that God is judge is yet another reason to love God, to worship God, to trust God with every part of your life, to trust God with everything that happens in this universe. The fact that God is judge is, in fact, a consequence of where we've been over the last few weeks. When we've started that God is creator, we saw in that that he is sovereign. That means his his authority is absolute and complete. We saw that he is good in his creation. Everything that he created was good, and he saw that it was good. So that was significant. We talked about the fact that God is love, and we we use that biblical definition of the choice to love, not just some kind of, you know, feelings-based, saccharine substitute of love, but actual, real love. And then last week, we did a deep dive on the fact that God is holy, the fact that God is set apart and distinct and different, transcendent from anything and anyone else ever anywhere. His holiness means that he is transcendent. He is morally pure. God never has a moral dilemma. And so if you take the fact that he is sovereign and good, if you take the fact that he is holy and love, then there's really no choice that God has but to be the judge of everything. And and I realize that that can be kind of a a hard reality to push up against. And like I said, if if you're one of those folks, I I completely, completely get it. But let me encourage you, don't stiff arm this reality too hard. As a matter of fact, I I wanna encourage you with with an illustration that I think paints the picture. How, How many of us like being on the ocean. Let me just see a show of hands. If you like being at the ocean, near the ocean, on the ocean, it's an amazing thing. There are a few things in the world that capture our soul and our imagination, like being on the water. It's a powerful thing. And if you're paying attention, if you know anything about at all about the ocean, you ought to have a little bit of, of very, very reverent fear of what the ocean can do. The ocean can very, very quickly become a powerful powerful enemy if we're not really, really careful and intentional. Years and years ago, I was fishing. I was deep sea fishing out in the Gulf of Mexico, and we were having an incredible day. We were catching fish hand over fist. I'm telling you that because you weren't there, and I'm a fisherman. (laughs) Might have been, might not have been, but we were having a ball. It was a great day. And as the day progressed, the waves kind of started to, to pick up a little bit, and a few of us on board got, got started to kind of feel just a little bit, you know, a little, little queasy and, and not feeling so good and, you know, trying to really keep your eye on the horizon. I was doing fine. There were a couple of other people that had gotten seasick already. Truly, so far, the story's not over. And, 
One time I, I had dropped the line down in the water and had a couple of fish competing for the hooks that were on the line and they tangled up the line. And so when I pulled it up, it was all tangled up. And while the swells were coming against the side of the boat, there was a little squall off to the side. We were keeping an eye on, but it wasn't raining on us. We were fine, but the waves were picking up. And when I took my eyes off of the horizon and I started looking down at this tangled line of fishing wine, it didn't take very long for Pastor Mac to become deeply and profoundly seasick. And I had to set the rod down and kind of lean up against the gunwale of the boat and look out to the horizon. The captain was up in the crow's nest of the boat and he goes, hey, you wanna know how to cure seasickness? And I'm sitting there praying for death. <laughs> and I think, he's got a secret. He, this guy's a captain, he's a professional. We've paid him good money to come out here and fish for fun. And I, I looked up and I go, yeah, how? And he goes, rub your back against an oak tree. Ah! <laughs> As a follower of Christ, you should never do that if you see someone who is having motion sickness. Well, what was happening was this squall that was off to one side of the boat was kind of gathering steam and getting a little closer and closer when all of a sudden we noticed there was another squall off of the other side of the boat. And it wasn't long before the captain was kind of watching these two storm cells approaching each other through the radar there at his cockpit. And finally he called the day. He said, boys, we got to make a move. These two cells are coming together. We got to get home. We were about 23 miles offshore at the time. And so we reeled up the lines and put everything away, stowed everything, battened down the hatches, and we started to just put the boogie on it, heading for home. We all gathered around the captain's console to watch the radar as we were making our way, and we could see these two storm cells approaching one another, and the little icon of the boat going right between them, and just going, are we going to make it? I don't know. Are we going to make it? I don't know when all of a sudden the little icon just scooted out from between the cells and there were blue skies ahead of us and we looked behind us and saw as these two storm cells came together and formed this one major storm as the boat carried us to safety. I think a lot of times people think the judgment of God is somehow random or happenstance or erratic. Like, like storms that just happen out of nowhere. When in reality, God, in his grace, in his love and wisdom, has given us scripture to tell us exactly what he does judge. Not only what he judges, but also to tell us why he judges. It, we don't have to wonder, is God going to get mad at this? We, we know what brings God pleasure. We know what causes God grief. Did you know that the Bible says your sin and my sin grieves the Holy Spirit of God. God grieves our sin, our brokenness, because he loves us. And, and so we don't have to, to worry, oh, what if I step this way and God zaps me with a bolt of lightning? That's not how God operates. But he does, in fact, operate as the judge. Solomon is referred to in the Bible as the wisest man, person, who ever walked the face of the earth, obviously, except Jesus. When Solomon ascended to the throne of Israel, God told him to ask for whatever he wanted. And Solomon, in his youth, asked for wisdom, wisdom to govern wisely, wisdom to lead and to judge the people of Israel. And God gave it to him. Now, we know how the story ends, and Solomon obviously did not always act with wisdom. The Bible tells us that he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. That's not a wise move. But for a season, he was the wisest person the world has ever known. The book of Ecclesiastes is Solomon's PhD doctoral dissertation on wisdom and meaning and purpose in life. He, he undertakes a Holy Spirit-driven experiment 
to chase all of the things that people chase, looking for purpose and meaning and pleasure in life. And he does this under the direction of God's Holy Spirit. And look at how he concludes this experiment, this doctoral dissertation in wisdom. It's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. That's an easy one to memorize. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. Here's what the Bible says. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, the fear of God is a loaded, very, very weighty, weighty term. Elsewhere, Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I want you to think about that. Without the fear of God, you have no wisdom. That you might get lucky and be wise from time to time, but the fear of the Lord is the foundation for all wisdom. To fear God, it, it does mean this sense of awe and reverence of, of who God is. We talked about that last week, awe and wonder, when we talked about the holiness of God, that he transcends anything we can imagine or conceive. But also in this is a sense of fear. The, the fact that God is the judge means that we ought to realize God's judgment is final. God's judgment is definitive. God's judgment is authoritative. There is a healthy biblical fear to that that we ought to recognize, but we also know that in Christ, because of the grace and the forgiveness of God delivered through Christ, we don't have to fear the judgment of God. We will be judged. You'll be judged. I'll be judged by God. But in Christ, we have nothing to fear, nothing at all to be afraid of. Now, why is God the judge? Well, I think it's important for us to understand that God has the credentials necessary to be a judge, that, that he is up to the task. I want to give you very quickly, well, let's say fairly quickly, six credentials judicial credentials that God possesses alone in all of the world. The first judicial credential is the fact that God is, his, it's his authority, his sovereignty. That makes him valid as judge. Ephesians chapter 1 says that power is the same as the mighty strength that he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, all power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate authority. He has the ultimate say. His sovereignty is supreme. Number two, his holiness. His holiness flows out of, it's manifested in his purity. Isaiah chapter five says, but the Lord Almighty, sovereign, will be exalted by his justice and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. When God judges, he is demonstrating his holiness. He's, he's proving it so that there's no question about it. Now, number three is a little bit tougher to take, and we're going to camp out here just a little bit longer, but it's a very, very real thing, and that is the wrath of God, the wrath or the anger of God, which is a direct expression of his morality. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The wrath of God is being revealed. God gets mad. God gets 
angry at sin, at, at brokenness. And, and by the way, this is a good thing. We, we want a God who hates sin, who hates brokenness. If that sounds harsh to you, again, I understand why, because we live in an age that doesn't want to deal with reality when it comes to judgment. But judgment is real. Let me see if I can frame it this way. We want a God who hates sin, who hates evil. Let's take, let's go back in history. Let's take the Holocaust. Like when I read about the Holocaust and I see what was done during World War II and before, it, it makes my skin crawl. Like you can't even believe the reality of what people did to other people. I want to know that God will absolutely take care of that, that God is so just that he will do something about that. He's not going to just go, oh, well, too bad, 13 million people dead. And it ain't six, by the way, 13 million people dead killed by evil incarnate. I want to know that God's going to do something about the evil of Hamas and Hezbollah. I want to know that God doesn't just wink at it and go, oh, well, you get a do-over next time. No, God cares, and he hates it. I think the best way to describe it, think of, think of a parent who finds out that their child is gravely, even mortally ill, as, as a parent, or maybe, maybe as a grandparent-to-be, I, I, would, I, would, I would be like, I hate that disease that has infected my child or my grandchild. I hate that this disease is diminishing who they were created to be. It makes me mad that it happens, and that is an appropriate response. I think a lot of times, especially Christians, think, I shouldn't be mad. I should never get mad. I'm a Christian. Man, no. Matter of fact, if you know somebody who thinks they should never get mad, those are the people to be really careful of. Because it's going to come out at some point. Sometimes anger is appropriate. When God is angry, it is always appropriate. Theologian J.I. Packer writes this. He says, God's wrath is never the capricious self-indulgent, irritable, morally ignoble thing that human anger so often is. I, that makes sense. How many of us have ever gotten mad and like you've almost kind of subconscious but kind of consciously just decide, I'm, I'm gonna lose it. I'm not guarding anything. I'm just gonna say whatever I think. Have you ever done that before? Thank you for your honesty. The rest of you? <laughs> anyway, that's not what God does. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. Even among humans, there is such a thing as righteous indignation, though it is perhaps rarely found. But God's indignation, all God's indignation is righteous. So I think, I think we're wise to, to fear God's wrath, but we need to remember God's wrath is always right. It is always an expression of his character and his nature. It's about morality and a sense of right and wrong. Number four, God's judicial credentials, justice. God will set everything right. He will make sure that everything is answered for and addressed. It's an expression of his integrity. Peter, in his letter to new Christians and new churches, cites Jesus on the cross for this. This is what he says, 1 Peter 2, 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Now, I want you to think about that for just a second. It's, it's too much to skate by. Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords. We've already established his authority and sovereignty. Jesus is on the cross in your place and in my place, becoming 
our sin, the Bible says. And people whose sin put him on the cross are yelling insults at him. They're mocking him. That fries a circuit in me. I'm just telling you, if I had been where Jesus was in that moment, I'd have been up there like, okay, just keep going. Just bring, okay. What's your name? Okay, thanks. I got you. Yeah, I know where you live, pal. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's not what Jesus did. When he suffered, he did not retaliate. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who justly judges. Jesus knew, God's got this. God, God will answer every injustice, every evil. God will address all of this in his perfect timing. Have you ever felt like it was your job to make somebody else aware that they had messed up? Have you ever like, Oh, no, they need to know. And I am God's agent. Have you ever done, anybody else ever done, I've done that. Come on, don't, don't leave me hanging. You all are terrible. <laughs> the son of God didn't do that. He said, I, I trust God. God says, do not repay evil for evil. I will avenge. It is mine Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He's just, and he's got this. He'll, he'll take care of it. Number five, God's knowledge and wisdom. Give him the credentials. Give him the credibility to judge. Out of his omniscience, his all-knowingness, his discernment. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. He is so all-knowing. He, he understands, he sees everything. You can't hide anything from God. Not anything that you've done and not any reason why you've done it. He knows it all. And then number six, his goodness. God is good. It's out of his generosity that he judges. If he is all powerful, and he is, but he chose not to address evil, not to address brokenness and sin in the world and not judge it, would he really be good? Look at what the book of Psalms says, Psalm 98. It says, let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. Do you see the connection between joy and judgment for God's people? You got, you, there's nothing to be afraid of here. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. In his goodness, he will judge. And as a child of God, as someone who's placed their faith in Christ, that is worth celebrating. It, it'll all be taken care of. The Apostle Peter grew up in a Jewish household. He was intimately acquainted with and familiar with the law of Moses, all of the Ten Commandments and, you know, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all the books that most of us skip when we're doing Bible study. And as such, Peter would have grown up in, in an ethos and an environment where it was just kind of assumed God liked them better because they kept those laws better. You know, if, if you had been living in Peter's day and age and somebody had called you a Gentile, a Jew called you a Gentile, that was not a, a compliment. That wasn't just a designation. That was like, ooh, Gentile. They didn't smile on that kind of thing. But in Acts chapter 10, the Bible records a vision that God gave to Peter. And in this vision, God showed to Peter a, a sheet of food being lowered. And on this sheet, this tablecloth, if you will, was all kinds of food. Some of it ceremonially clean, some of it ceremonially unclean. Peter never would have even thought about eating it. 
And, and it was shown to Peter on three different occasions. And God said, go and eat. And Peter was like, I can't. I wouldn't. I won't. And God said, no, no, no. Go and eat three different times. And after the third time, God said, Peter, you're missing the point. Don't, don't call unclean that which God has made clean. And at the same moment that Peter was having this vision, there was a Roman centurion in the town of Caesarea. And God was giving this Roman centurion named Cornelius a different vision. Cornelius was being told to invite Peter to his house. Now, as a Roman centurion who was familiar with Jewish customs, Cornelius would have known, Peter's not coming to my house. I don't even need to extend the invitation. But because he had received a vision, he obeyed, and he invited Peter over. Because Peter had received a vision, he obeyed, and he accepted the invitation. Now, as a Roman centurion who was from Italy, Cornelius had three strikes against him when it came to Peter walking in his house. He was Roman, so by definition, to the Jews of Peter's day, he was unclean. He wouldn't have defiled himself by walking into that household. They would have been eating all kinds of food that the Jews wouldn't eat. The fact that he was a Roman soldier and centurion, strike two. I'm not associated with him. They're, they're trying to keep us down. They're, they're persecuting us. And so Peter overlooks all of these things on the heels of this vision that God gave him and says, not only the fact that he's a Roman, he's a Roman soldier, and even worse, he's from Italy. Peter goes, I'll go in anyway. And so when he walks in, the Bible says that Cornelius and his household begin to bow down and, and all, essentially worship Peter. And Peter goes, no, 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 not me, not me. And he goes, what, what, why did you invite me? And Cornelius says, I had a vision, and, and I, I need you to tell us about this Jesus that you follow, that you preach about. And look at what Peter says. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 35, and then 42 through 43. Then Peter began to speak. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Remember Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14? Verse 42. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All of the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So it's one thing to acknowledge God is the judge. Okay, I, intellectually I can get there, but but here in Acts chapter 10, God gives us a template of what to do. How, how, do we, how do we live in that reality? How do we live out that reality day in and day out when we're not just talking about it at church on a Sunday morning? And there are three things that are right here in the text. Number one, thank God for his justice. Thank God for his justice. This is justice for all. What did Peter say? I now realize God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation. This is not just a Jewish thing. This is not just a Jerusalem thing. This is an every nation thing. He accepts from every nation the one who fears him, awes and reverence. Thank God for his justice. Number two, share the gospel. Share the gospel. As a follower of Christ, if, if, if you only did one thing as a follower of Christ, it should be share the gospel. It's great that you go to Bible study. That's awesome. Awesome that you're at church on Sunday morning after Texas loses. That's awesome. Way to go. But to share the good news of Jesus Christ is why God gives us breath every day. And if you've never done it before, I know it can be intimidating. Start here. Start by just inviting someone with you to go to church. I promise you, if you get them here, we will introduce them to Christ. I promise you that. You're here. 
more than 85% of you because somebody invited you. Somebody shared the gospel with you. But it's not just inviting them to church. There's also those conversations that you have, conversations where you're praying, God, give me the words to say. Help me to not say something stupid. Oh, Mac, what if they ask me something I don't know the answer to? Welcome to my world. Happens all the time. If somebody asks you something you don't know, here's what you tell them. I don't know. That's one of the most mature things you could ever say to somebody. Immature people make stuff up. Well, you know, I heard. No, no. Here's what you tell them. Go, man, I don't know, but let's go find out together. You know, you, you do the work. Sharing the gospel is why we are alive. If we didn't need to share the gospel, God could beam us up the second we come to faith in Christ. See ya. Oh, look, there goes another one. But he leaves you here. He leaves me here for a purpose. Share the gospel. And then number three, live in the comfort of God's justice. When you understand that in Christ Jesus, there is nothing to fear. Will I be judged? Yeah, I will be. God will bring everything that I've ever said, done, or thought into the light. But then I think he's going to do the same thing for you. Okay. And in Christ, there's nothing to fear. In Christ, I've been forgiven. In Christ, I can own all my junk. I don't have to hide anything from you or anybody else. In Christ, I've been forgiven. My sins removed from me as far as the east is from the west. In Christ, look at the book of Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. No condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of Moses was a gift of God's grace to show us we need forgiveness. When you look at those laws, it's like, whoa, I can't keep all of those. I can't keep all of those by lunch today. That's the law of sin and death. Jesus brings the law of life and grace and truth. And when you understand that, when you receive that, that's when you start to experience the peace that passes all understanding. That's when you understand there is no condemnation no condemnation in Christ. Therefore, I will live like it. I want to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. If you're here today and you have never responded to his grace initiative, I want to extend to you an invitation from our church. It's actually an invitation from Christ himself to enter into his rest, his grace. It's not about your performance or my performance because we can't do enough to earn his grace. His grace is a free gift. It's a gift that needs to be, has to be received. It has to be responded to. If you're here today and you've never received it, maybe you're watching online, you've never received this gift, then we want to invite you to do it right now. Just to pray a prayer of receipt, a prayer of beginning, a prayer of commitment and surrender. Just in your own words, say something like this directly to Christ, say, Jesus, I need you. Just silently, right where you are, from your heart to his, just say it silently. Jesus, I need you. 
I know that you know everything, you see everything. And I understand that you will be my judge and that you desire to be my savior, my forgiver. And so I accept. I accept your offer. I accept you as the Lord of my life, as the Savior of my life. I choose to believe that you died on the cross for me and that you rose again from the dead for me. And in this moment, I accept. I receive what you did for myself as my own. And in exchange for your life, I give you my life. And I will follow you from this day forward. Lord, I pray this prayer in your name. If you would just remain with your heads bowed for another moment. If that was your prayer, and this is the greatest moment of your life, this is just the beginning. And as a church, we would love to help with what comes next. When we dismiss in just a minute, out in the lobby to your right, there's an area there called the Welcome Center. We've got a gift we would love to give you. It's just a Bible and a reading plan to help you begin growing in this relationship. All you gotta do, just go by there and say, hey, today was my day, and they know exactly what you're talking about, and they'll put it in your hand. Second of all, as our heads are bowed for just another moment, if you just prayed that prayer, if you're here in the room, would you raise your hand? Just raise your hand and hold it up high over your head for a moment. If you're online, let your online host know. But your hand in the air is important, and, and here's why. The Bible says that all of heaven celebrates when one person turns for home, when one person steps into that grace initiative. And so as the family of faith, as a church, we celebrate and honor that with you. You can go ahead and put your hands down, but we're gonna put our hands together just to tell you, welcome home. Welcome home. Next week, we will be continuing this series looking at God is good. That's next week, and have a great week, and God bless you. Thanks.